What's up, everybody? It's Izzy from PowerLifingToWin.com, and today we are going to talk about deadlift form. We're going to analyze quite a few different styles and talk about which is the best for the sport of powerlifting. Now, our analysis here is going to proceed from the understanding that you already have a basic foundation in mechanics as they relate to powerlifting. So if you don't know what a moment arm is, go ahead and look in the description box and check out the link to part one of this series and then come back to this video after you've watched that. Otherwise, you're really not going to know what I'm talking about here. So because we've already covered the deadlift setup, what we're going to focus on here is the other two really important aspects of optimizing powerlifting technique, and that is minimizing range of motion and minimizing the relevant moment arms of the movement. So in the deadlift, there's only one moment arm that we're primarily concerned with, and that is a moment arm between the hips and the bar. You can see the white arrow there between the orange line, which is the bar, and the red dot, which is the hip. That represents the moment arm that we're working against in the deadlift. Powerlifters primarily use one of two ways to minimize a moment arm between the hips and the bar. And one of the more popular ones is the sumo deadlift. Now the sumo deadlift works for very much the same reasons that a wide stance squat works. Because when you take a sumo stance, the legs get held at an angle. They're pushed out, and when they're pushed out, they don't cover as much space front to back. So if you're looking here at the, pic the, the picture on the right, you can see that the distance between the knee and the hip is decreased a little bit because the legs are being pushed out. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So when we're not holding our leg in a straight line, but at a diagonal line, it's going to cover less distance. Now, one of the other primary advantages of a sumo deadlift is it actually decreases your range of motion. So take a look at the picture on the left here. I'm doing a conventional deadlift, and on the picture on the right, I'm doing a sumo deadlift. I've drawn a line on the conventional deadlift lockout bar height across into the other picture to show how much lower that the sumo lockout bar height is. And you can see that I've definitely cut off three or four inches off of my total range of motion with the sumo stance. So at first glance, it would seem like sumo is a huge win for powerlifting. We shorten the range of motion, we decrease the moment arm between the bar and the hips, so we're improving our leverage, don't have to move the bar as far. Based on all the criteria that we've talked about in this series thus far, the sumo should be the style that we go with. But here's the thing, the sumo deadlift actually represents a bit of a trade-off. Notice the picture on the left. I want you to look specifically at the, the knee angle and the hip angle of the conventional deadlift. Next, compare it to the knee angle and the hip angle of the sumo deadlift. Now, you'll notice that the knee angle is much more closed on the sumo deadlift. Okay, So is the hip angle for that matter. In exchange, what you get is a more upright back angle, a shorter range of motion, and a shorter moment arm. But that doesn't always lead to people lifting more weights for one big because of one thing. And that one thing is that actually the deadlift tends to be hardest right at the bottom of the range of motion. And a sumo deadlift makes it harder at the bottom of the range of motion because your knees and hips are more closed, so they're in a worse position just to get the bar moving. After all, can you do more on a quarter squat or a half squat? obviously a quarter squat, right? And one of the big reasons why is because a quarter squat puts your knee in a more mechanically efficient position because the joint angle is more open. Let's take a look at the bottom of the deadlift a little more closely. Okay, so I want you again to compare the knee, hip, and back angle on both positions here. At the bottom, the knee angle is more closed. The hip angle is more closed. The back angle is more leaned over. So why on earth would the lockout be harder on a conventional deadlift? So I already know, I can hear you saying, well, I know tons of people who struggle at the lockout. And that's true. There are tons of people who struggle at the lockout. But it's not because of the mechanical efficiency of the position. Usually, it's because they round their back. And that leads us in to the next way that powerlifters decrease the distance between the hips and the bar. Okay, so on the left we have a round back deadlift, and on the right we have a relatively flat back deadlift. Look at the distance between the hips and the bar on both pictures, and then look at both the knee angle and the hip angle in both pictures. 
So the rounded back deadlift very clearly opens up the hip angle, opens up the knee angle, and makes you more horizontal and rounds your back. So that's the trade-off for the rounded back deadlift. At least that's part of it. And the reason why people round their back in the deadlift is because of what it does to the knee and the hip angle. Normally, the deadlift is really hard to break off of the floor. But when you round your back, you basically take that from, you can almost see it somewhat of a half squat over there on the right, to more of a true quarter squat position for the legs. And this puts them in a much more mechanically efficient position to get that bar moving off of the ground. And in fact, when you round your back, you can often generate a ton of speed and momentum off of the floor. But here's the problem, and let's take a look. Okay, what we have here is Dave Hansen, a very strong 181 pound lifter trying to lock out a 700 plus pound deadlift. What I want you to notice is how rounded his back is. But here's the other thing. Look at his hips and his knees. They're almost already completely locked out. Because when you round your back, what can actually happen is that you can finish extending your knees and extend your hips, but the pull won't be finished because you still have to uncurl or unround your back at the top. So basically what you're doing is you know, doing a back extension with 700 pounds at the top of the deadlift. This is not a great idea because the muscles responsible for doing this are not designed to do it. They're designed to work isometrically. Let's take a closer look at this muscle. So the muscles responsible for holding your back flat and also extending your back if it gets round in a pull is the group of muscles known as the erector spinae. And you can see them right here on the picture with the arrow pointed to them. And you have to understand, again, the job of these muscles, their natural intention is to hold the back flat. They work isometrically. They don't work concentrically. But when you round your back, that's exactly what you make them do. So remember how we were looking at a picture of the bottom of the deadlift and the top, and we saw that at the top of the deadlift, the hip angle's more open, the knee angle's more open, and the back angle's more upright. So realistically, if you should be able to do a lot more at lockout than you can off of the ground, right? Well, that's why people actually do pull more from the rack or off boxes than they do from the floor. Because when you do rack pulls, generally you don't need to round your back to get the bar moving. And if you can hold your back flat, lockout has much better leverage. But when you see people round their back to get the bar moving off of the floor, and then they get stuck at lockout, this is why. This group of muscles, the erector spinae, they're relatively small compared to the hips, hamstrings, and quads, which if you hold your back flat are normally the muscles that are responsible for lockout. But when you round your back and your hips extend and your knees extend, well, now you have just this tiny band of muscle on either side of your spine known as the erector spinae, which is responsible for doing a back extension with 500, 600, 700 pounds or however strong you are on a maximal deadlift. This is all well and good, but I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, well, okay, then what, which one is better? How should I actually deadlift? What is the technique I should use to pull knowing all of this? Well, here's the thing. A lot of, there, there's really two factors that determine which technique that you should use, or at least go into influencing which technique ends up being better for you. And it really is a, your body type, and B, your individual muscular strengths and weaknesses. So let's delve into that a little more. Okay, so here we've got a picture of a long arm deadlifter and a short arm deadlifter. And we've got all the important mechanical markers um, marked. So you can see here the, the moment arm between the bar and the hips. It's going to be longer on the short arm deadlifter. You can see the back angle marked by the orange line. You can see how it's more upright on the long arm deadlifter. We can see the hip angle and the knee angles on both deadlifters marked by the green lines. And really what we see is that for the long armed deadlifter, he's naturally going to have a more upright back angle with a more open knee and hip angle. What this means is that for the long armed deadlifter, because his back angle is naturally more upright due to his body type, 
he doesn't need as much lower back strength to hold his back flat as a short arm deadlifter. Why? Well, remember, the longer a moment arm is, the stronger the moment arm is. And a more upright back angle decreases the moment arm between the lower back and the bar. So even if both deadlifters here have the exact same amount of lower back strength, the deadlifter on the left needs less lower back strength to maintain his back angle than the guy on the right. So for body type implications, if you have longer arms, it's going to be easier to hold your back flatter. Now, here's the thing, regardless of body type, the sumo deadlift will always be limited by leg strength and the conventional deadlift will pretty much always be limited by lower back strength. Here's the thing, even if you have long arms and an upright back angle in the deadlift, the hardest part of the range of motion is still breaking the bar from the floor. So if the legs are weaker than the back, what's going to happen? Well, the back is going to round a little bit so that the knee angle opens up and the hip angle opens up and the bar starts moving off of the floor, right? So regardless if you have short arms or long arms, in a conventional deadlift, the hardest part is keeping your back flat at the bottom of the lift because the bottom of the lift is the hardest part to get the bar moving. So what that means is that what's going to limit your deadlift as a conventional deadlifter is whether or not you can get past however much rounding that you have at the top of your deadlift. Now what's going to limit your sumo deadlift is, not, is never really going to be your lower back because your lower back is at a much more upright angle and when we put the lower back at a or the whole back at a more upright angle it takes less lower back strength to hold our back flat because we've so greatly decreased the moment arm between the back and the bar so we need way less lower back strength to maintain a sumo position however the trade-off is that our knee angle is much more closed, and a more closed knee angle means that we need much greater quadriceps strength to get the bar started off of the floor. So here's the implications. Pretty much regardless of the way that you're built, if your legs are stronger than your back, you're going to pull more sumo, and if your back is stronger than your legs, you're going to pull more conventional. That's not to say that body type is irrelevant because body type still influences which one will be stronger, right? Because if you naturally have a more upright back angle due to long arms, well, your back doesn't need to be as strong, so it's less likely that your back is gonna be the weak link in the chain. Whereas if you have short arms and you're very bent over, it's more likely that your back is going to be the weak link, the weak link in the chain and that using sumo will allow your legs to quickly surpass your back. But here's the bottom line. You can observe phenomenal deadlifters using both styles with both arm lengths. There are short arm deadlifters who are fantastic conventional pullers. And there are long arm deadlifters who are world record holders in the sumo deadlift. In fact, if you check my channel, I'm, I'm going to put up a video of a highlight reel of all the world record deadlifts from 148 to 242. And what you'll notice is that every single one of them is held by a sumo puller. And not only that, every single one of them is held by a long arm sumo puller. So while it's true, the conventional advice that if you have long arms, you'll probably naturally be a better conventional puller. And if you have short arms, you'll probably naturally be a better sumo puller. With specific training, it doesn't necessarily matter. And regardless of your body type, you can end up excelling with one technique or the other. But as for my personal recommendation, I recommend that everyone who doesn't already have extensive training in one style or the other, I recommend that you pull sumo, and here's why. Sumo has a shorter range of motion, and it has better leverage in terms of the fact that the hips are closer to the bar. So that means whatever strength that you do have is going to go further with sumo because you don't have to move the bar as far and your leverage is better. You're overcoming less leverage, not moving the bar as far. That means given your level of strength, you move more weight. Another reason that I recommend sumo is that if your federation uses a deadlift bar, well, what does a deadlift bar help the most? A deadlift bar doesn't change your lockout height. You're still going to lock out at the same height. But a deadlift bar cuts off range of motion from the bottom of the movement. And for a sumo puller, that is going to allow you to lift more weight because it's going to allow you to have a higher hip, 
higher hip position, and a more open knee angle. So you're gonna get more carryover from the bar. Versus a conventional deadlifter, uh, if they're rounding their back, they're not going to get as much carryover, right? Because the, the, the bar itself is not actually helping them in the weakest part of their range of motion. The second thing in terms of bars is that with a sumo deadlift, you don't need as strong of a grip. In a conventional deadlift with a round back, you can end up having a really long pull. And I, I mean that in terms of the seconds that you spend holding onto the bar. Because if you round your back a lot, at the top of the deadlift, it often takes quite a long time for you to grind through and get your back straight again. And while you're sitting there grinding, you can lose hold of the bar. Whereas with the sumo deadlift, you either break the bar from the ground or you don't. And if you break the bar from the ground, it pretty much flies up to lockout instantly because the hardest part of the sumo deadlift is always right off of the ground. So the sumo deadlift, if you have small hands or a weak grip, can be a great way to get around that limitation because your pulls are going to be uh, shorter in terms of the actual time that you spend hanging onto the bar. Last but certainly not least, there's a weird phenomenon in powerlifting that almost everybody agrees exists. And that is when you pull heavy conventional deadlifts, you tend to get localized lower back fatigue. And what, here's what's really going on. When you have a relatively small muscle group, like the lower back, and you expose this relatively small muscle group to a huge load, like say trying to do a back extension with 600 pounds, you get a huge amount of fatigue because a little muscle group like that is not normally responsible for dealing with such a huge load. So with sumo, you can avoid this. And the reason why you want to avoid it is that because of this lower back fatigue, a lot of conventional pullers will only pull once every 7 to 10 days. In fact, I know people that only pull heavy once every 2 weeks. This, this level of frequency is simply not optimal for driving your lifts as high as they can go. I mean, imagine if you only benched heavy, heavy once every week or once every other week. Do you think your bench would be as high as it is? I sincerely doubt it. And with sumo deadlift, you don't get this localized lower back fatigue because the main, the main limitation in the movement is not your back. It's your legs. Your legs are highly trainable. They're a bigger muscle group than your lower back. They grow better and they have more potential for strength because they're bigger. So overall, my recommendation to you guys is the following. If you haven't already spent years developing your conventional deadlift technique, I think you should switch to sumo because all of the reasons that we've already mentioned, the leverage is better, the range of motion is shorter, it's easier for your grip, you'll get more out of a deadlift bar if you use a deadlift bar, and you can train it much more often. You can train it with more volume, with more frequency, and that's going to lead you to driving it up more efficiently. Now here's the thing. A lot of people try sumo deadlift and once or twice or for a few weeks and then they quit. You're, you know, all technique changes are going to take you backwards before they take you forwards. And the thing about the sumo deadlift is that it's highly technical. It's not like the conventional deadlift where you can just grab the bar and pick it up. You can just use brute strength to make the lift work. Because with sumo, if you have poor form, what you get is none of the advantages of sumo in terms of the hips being closer to the bar and the shorter range of motion and all that, but you still get all the disadvantages of a wide stance, which means that you're you're going to have to have uh, way stronger legs for no benefit because your, your knee angle is going to be more closed and your hip angle is going to be more closed. So if you're interested in using the sumo deadlift, if you found this argument convincing, Make sure that you check this channel again for the next video that we put out on sumo deadlift technique because if you don't have good sumo, te good sumo deadlift technique, there is absolutely no point in using a sumo stance. You, you will lift more conventional if you don't use proper technique with sumo. So if you want to see that video, make sure that you subscribe. It'll be out in the next couple of days. So guys, like I said, if you want to see that sumo deadlift record highlight reel, check the channel. The video will be up at any moment um if that if you found this article confusing and you want a bit more detail or clarification i'm going to go ahead and put a link in the description box to the original article that i wrote on this topic which covers everything in far more depth and does a little bit better job of explaining things at a reasonable pace i know i can talk fast sometimes and it's easy to miss things so if you want to check that out just go go ahead and look for the link in the description box all right 
Again, I hope that was helpful. If you guys have any questions, feel free to post a comment. I look at them all. I read them all. And as always, if you're looking for more great powerlifting information, make sure you check out powerliftingtowin.com. Have a good one.